All right, uh, we're going to talk tonight about the Holy Spirit. And uh, you have to run a number of references, and most of them be around John, Gospel of John, so get somewhere around John uh, 15 and 16, and then occasionally we'll go over in other places, and I'll try to give you time to turn the verses, because it's very important. Uh, there's probably more misinformation about the Holy Ghost in America today yeah. as there has been in uh, six millenniums of history. And you should know what the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit. Uh, Baptists have uh, been kind of leery of talking about the Holy Ghost, at least uh, uh, in most places around the country. So the Charismatics got them a good opening to step in there and really mess it up good. And they got in there and messed up the Baptists real good. And you should know what the Bible said about the Holy Ghost and what the Charismatics say about the Holy Ghost is uh, as far off base as you can get. Yeah. The people in the Bible who bragged about their, uh, they bragged about their knowledge of the Holy Ghost. The, the gifts, you know, are in, in Corinthians. The gifts of tongue and those gifts and the, and the, that's, that's, that's all you can think about is the gifts. Everybody got that little gift. And, uh, the people in the Corinthians, you're talking about the gifts of the Holy Ghost, didn't even know the Holy Ghost was in them. Paul said to the Corinthians, what? Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The dumb Corinthians didn't know the Holy Spirit was in them. Right. Well, they're bragging about tongues. That's typical, absolutely typical. Now, there's something you should know about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about these, uh, talk about these here. And, uh, first of all, you want to understand, if you read the Bible at all, you must understand that the Holy Spirit of God uh, is uh, 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 manifest in seven major operations in the Bible, seven of them. He is manifest in creation. Didn't you read in your Bible, Genesis 1? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, there is without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Creation. He manifests at the beginning. He shows up before you've been through that three verses. Up shows up the Holy Spirit. He manifests in creation. He manifests in revelation. You say, how do you know he's manifest in revelation? You know he's manifest in revelation because he says, all scripture is given by inspiration. Or inspiration. All scripture is given inspiration of God. God breathing in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is the ins- inspiration means God's breath. That's the Spirit. He's manifest in, in uh, revelation. He's manifest in inspiration. He's manifest in uh, incarnation. Uh, Jesus Christ is not only born of God, he's uh, given birth by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing that should be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, conceiving Jesus Christ and Mary. The Holy Spirit is manifest in creation and revelation, inspiration. The Holy Spirit is manifest in incarnation. God was manifest in the flesh, the book says. Well, if that isn't all, he's manifest in regeneration, uh, born of the Spirit. Except a man be born of the Spirit, you must be born again. He's manifest in regeneration. He's manifest in uh, sanctification, intercession. By sanctification, it uh, means you're set apart. Paul said you're set, set apart by the Holy Spirit. Set apart by the Holy Spirit, that's, uh, that's uh, sanctification and intercession. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's how important the Holy Spirit is in your Bible. And the first thing you need to know about the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit uh, convicts of sin. Uh, your New Testament talks about it uh, uh, reproving, uh, uh, convinces of sin, reproofs of sin, convicts of sin. That means the Holy Spirit, and I'm just going to draw an outline now. We're not going to make it a solid picture of Christ with flesh on the hand because uh, the Holy Spirit's the Spirit and the invisible. And it's the Holy Spirit that puts his finger on your heart and says you're a sinner. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 16, look at verse 8. John 16, verse 8. The Holy Spirit was brought into this world to reprove men or convince men of three things. And they're given in the passage. You don't ever hear the charismatics even talk about it. They don't know why he's even here. There's John chapter 16. And look down verse 16 about verse 8. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's going to convict of sin. Why of sin? 
Why of sin? Because they believe not on me. What verse is that? Nine. See that thing? When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't convict you of drink, drinking or adultery or fornication <clears throat> or lying or swearing or stealing or killing. That's just talk. When the Holy Spirit comes, he convicts a man of the sin of not believing on Christ. It's right in front of your face. Now, the Holy Spirit can show you things in your life that aren't right, and your conscience can bear witness that you're doing wrong, and the Holy Spirit can give you stuff to show you when you're doing wrong, but he's not in the world today to convince men of sin outside of the sin of rejecting the cure for sin. That's the problem. You're all going to sin anyway. <laughs> your problem is how to get saved from sin, right? Well, that's what he's in the world for. He shows you the cure. The cure is Christ. If you don't accept him, you don't accept the cure. If you don't accept the cure, what difference do your sins make? One sin is as good as another. All of, there is no difference. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. They say, well, no sin will land into heaven. Well, then you won't make it. <laughs> and I won't make it. If no sin will ever heaven and we go the way we are, none of us are going to make it. What you've got to do is get the cure. What you've got to do is get a sinless person to take your place. And that's what the Holy Spirit convinces of. He convinced of sin. He convicts of sin because they believe not on me. Uh, do you take a, a conviction is not a feeling. Conviction is a realization. The heart is deceitful above all things is desperately wicked. Now, I'm drawing you a valentine there because I'm not, can't you draw a left ventricle and bite right ventricle and the valves and all that kind of stuff. But you understand when I talk about the heart, I'm talking about like, uh, you know, let's trade hearts. So I lost my heart. She lost her heart. He got his heart. She got her, uh, his, his heart. He got her heart. He lost my heart. Right here somewhere. Can't find the thing. All that kind of stuff. You made a lot of mistakes in talking that fast. <laughs> I made one this morning. I said the guy fell off a typewriter. <laughs> That's quite a shot, you know, fall off a typewriter and break your fool neck. <laughs> Been a mighty big typewriter. It's one of Paul Bunyan's typewriters. I meant to say tightrope. <laughs> See, but there's many a slip, tricks, tongue and lip, you know. That's how that thing goes. All right, a convince of sin. And then, and, then, and then the next thing you have to do with uh, is uh, regeneration. Uh, you know, it, did you, it's a strange what, uh, thing you talk, when you you know, talk to people about the thing that bothers them and what they're under conviction of. Uh, it's, it's funny they never mention the main sin they ought to be under conviction about. Uh, how many sinners have you ever heard say they were sorry they rejected Christ? Isn't that a strange thing? They're sorry they got drunk. They're sorry they got caught. They're sorry they did this. But when you ever a sinner say, Oh God, please forgive me for not accepting your son. And that's what he's here for. You know what that shows? That shows the Holy Spirit isn't taking much time out to deal with folks like he used to. That shows the country's in trouble. Now you take, uh, you take uh, Jack Hiles, his father-in-law was an unsaved man. His father-in-law was an unsaved man, and uh, he, he was a, his, his daughter was saved, married Jack Hiles. And Hiles was saved, of course, and he witnessed to his uh, father-in-law, but didn't get uh, much anywhere with him. And right before that fellow died, he was, a, he, was a, he was a good good Texan, you know, typical Texan. I mean, paid his bill, took care of his family, all that kind of stuff, but just lost as a golf ball in high weeds. And right before he died, he had a terrible onset of cancer and went from about 230 pounds down to about 135 and as he was dying the last few days, he called Jack into his bedside, and he called him in his bedside, and he called him in his bedside. Uh, Jack snorted, you know, and now, uh, Daddy, you know, called him his Daddy, you know, and I hope you have this and that and so forth and so on, and feeling better, and uh, we're, we're praying for you and that kind of stuff. And he said, he said, uh, Jack, he said, would you do me a favor? And he said, what's that? He said, would you talk to me one time just in plain language, <laughs> like you'd talk to a sinner? And so he talked to him like he talked to a sinner. And when he got through, that fellow was under deep conviction. That fellow got under convic conviction and bowed his head there in the bed and prayed and asked Christ to save him. And got saved before he went on to meet the, meet the Lord. But you know what that fellow prayed? And Hyle said he never heard a fellow pray at sins, and I never have either. When that fellow began to pray, you know the first thing he prayed was? The first thing he prayed was, Lord... Please forgive me for putting off your son so long, and I apologize for rejecting him as long as I have. And boy, that's conviction. See, that ain't something you just made up feeling sorry about yourself for getting caught, man. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, you're wrong, you've done messed up. 
Now, that's conviction. All right, that is no. The Holy Spirit is not only involved in conviction, the Holy Spirit is involved in regeneration. We'll have a baby here. Uh, every, every, every church ought to have a spiritual nursery. And what is a spiritual nursery? A spiritual nursery is a place where uh, the church brings forth babies. You say, what babies in Christ? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, and desire the sincere miracle of the word, that you may grow thereby. Uh, so every, every church ought to have a nursery in it for born-again new Christians, saved people. He says about a new Christian, he says, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Which means every new convert is like a brand new baby. And uh, blessed is the church that uh, brings forth uh, children into this world, born again, born by the Holy Spirit. Uh, one time we had a little boy in our uh, church over there at Brent, a little boy about well, about 10 years old. He got saved and he began to witness right away. He just witnessed all over the place. And the next door neighbor got really upset with him because he was witnessing that little girl. And I guess she was about eight <laughs> and talking about being saved and telling her she's going to go to hell. <laughs> she get saved, that kind of thing. And mom and daddy kind of got upset, you know, it's child, child abuse and all that junk. And they called my, the, the parents of this little boy's, uh, uh, they called us they, his, their attention, this boy's parents, and we also were members of my church. They said, your little boy here has no business talking to my little girl about religion. And he was standing right there listening to him, you know, turning the report on him. And he said, yeah, and they said, after all, your little boy is just a child. And that 10-year-old kid said, that's right, I'm just a child of God. <laughs> that's correct. That's correct. If you're saved, you're God's child. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. And uh, when John writes, he says, oh, I, I want to, I want to have my, see my little children do this, and I want to see my little children walk in, in righteousness and that kind of thing. He's talking about uh, uh, birth. The Holy Spirit regenerates somebody. When you're born again, you're born again by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes into the Christian, and when the Holy Spirit comes into a Christian, then the, 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 the resident should be the president. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I mean the resident of your body, what, no, you're not your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. The resident should be president. He ought to be running the place, you know. The boarder should be the boss, see? I mean, the B-O-A-R-D, the guys, you know, fellow find a place to stay. Well, when the Holy Spirit comes in and find a place to stay, he should run the place. That's the border should be the boss, and the resident should be the president. What, no, you're not your body, the temple, the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Uh, he regenerates. Uh, I trace my family tree uh, back to uh, Lord Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because he's my spiritual father, and uh, my human spiritual father was Hugh Pyle, and Hugh Pyle led me to Christ. That's my family tree. Now, I don't trace my family tree back to a monkey in a banana tree down in South Africa. If you want to take a black woman in South Africa to be your first ancestor, help yourself. It doesn't appeal to me a bit. That's uh, leaky. That's uh, National Geographic. You all come from a, you know, a black woman down there in Southeast Africa. That's where Ebola and AIDS come from. Don't you know that? Not within a hundred miles of it. That's a pretty rough place to have a start. One time, my father was talking with a Christian about these things. He was telling me, this Christian, you don't believe in evolution. You should believe in evolution. And he said, well, he said, uh, you, you, where where'd you come from? And the guy said, we came, you listed all this stuff, you know. And the Christian thought about it, and then he said, well, near as I can tell, what you're saying is that you either have to come from a monkey or come from a bunch of birds, and I don't see any feathers on you, <laughs> so you must come from monkeys. <laughs> I guess that's how it is. I mean, if you're an evolutionist, uh, I don't see any feathers on you. So you must have come out of, out of a banana tree or something on a, during a coconut break. <laughs> that isn't my ancestry. That may be yours. That isn't mine. My ancestry, my human ancestry, goes back to Adam. That's where it goes. And my spiritual ancestry goes back to God's Son. And like the song says... I'm a child of the King, I'm a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. And who's responsible for this? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active in, in regeneration. Except a man be born of the water and the, and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said in the he must be born again. If you're God's child, and a lot of them here tonight, uh, let me ask you teenage kids, or you kids in middle school, 
that go to public school, and I don't know how many of you do, but you kids here that go to middle school or high school, something like that, and you're a saved child of God, do you remember that when you're in school? Do you remember in the classroom that you're a child of God? See, everybody wants to get rid of the differences, make them all together. They're not all children of God in them classrooms. And if you're saved, you're an oddball in there. Do you remember that? You'll remember that. You'll keep you from getting sucked in with the flow. Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is regeneration. Uh, born again, not of, not, not of the flesh, not born of man, or the will of man, but born, he says, born, he says, of God. That's the business. All right, now there's something else about him. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 4, pick this up. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And this one says this. This one says, Grieve not, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until you fall from grace. Is that what it says? Of course it doesn't. That's some of that charismatic bunk. You're not sealed till you fall from grace. You're sealed the day of redemption. And he says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. A seal is put on something to shut it up, to stop it up, to keep from leaking. A thing is sealed so it can't be opened. And back uh, back there in the Old Testament, you have a perfect example of that in the decrees of the Persian kings. And you read in where Cyrus is dealing with uh, oh, uh, Esther and uh, Mordecai and Haman and that bunch, and Artaxerxes, and where uh, Darius is dealing with... Uh, Daniel, he says, and see with the king seal that no man can reverse it. For the laws of the Medes and Persians, the law that's established by a king can't be changed. And when they put the king seal on that thing, that sealed it, and it fixed. It can't be changed. And when God Almighty saved you and gave you the new birth, he fixed you, so you're going to be sealed up like this envelope being sealed up. And you've got the seal of the king on that seal. And who can open that thing? Nobody can open that thing but God. That's who's going to open that thing. And that thing won't be open until you get up there at the rapture and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, on the way up, you're going to be changed. You're going to get a body like his on the way up. And when that thing takes place, the Bible calls that the redemption of your body. I've got a track by a Campbellite there. A fellow showed me it said a man is saved by repentance, Scripture. He's saved by confession, Scripture. He's saved by hope, Scripture, and he's saved by water, Scripture. And uh, it said he's saved by hope, and that ain't true. <laughs> the hope is your second coming when Christ comes and saves your body. That not to do your soul. First Peter says you have received the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So when you get saved, your soul is saved, and your spirit is born again, and God stamps you with a seal, and it says, do not open until Christmas. <laughs> and at the rapture, it's opened. What's that? That's, quote, quote, the redemption of the body. That is, a, so you got, when I don't hope I'm saved. I know I'm saved. But when I say, no, I'm saved, I'm talking about my soul. I'm not talking about my body. I hope my body is saved. <laughs> You say, why? Because it ain't saved yet. Well, if it's saved, you wouldn't go to the dirt, would you? Why do you just keep on coming and go to the dirt? Because it hadn't been redeemed yet. But bless God, it's going to be redeemed. The Bible says we're saved by hope. What is it? To wit, to wit, the redemption of the body. Now, who's involved in that? That's the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, it, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit has plenty of work to do. Here's the people worrying about, well, I don't think you're saved by grace. You don't think you're saved by grace, that kind of thing. These people worry about you not being saved by grace. What would they know about it? They never experienced grace. Uh, grace is free. That grace, that free grace is called the gift of God. The gift of God. And he said the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the Holy Spirit is uh, involved uh, in uh, sealing you. And sealing you the day of, day of, day of redemption. Uh, there's a, a passage in Timothy that speaks about that seal having two sides. And it says one side it says this and the other side it says this. And that seal has one side that says 
the Lord knoweth them that are his. And the other side of the seal says, uh, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ uh, depart from iniquity. All right, the Holy Spirit is found in the sealing, and that is no. The Holy Spirit does this. The Holy Spirit magnifies Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible there, uh, turn to uh, John 15 and look at verse 26. John 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit magnifies Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit wants to point out something to you, he emphasizes God's Son. He doesn't emphasize himself. When you have somebody always talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, and getting the Holy Ghost, and have the Holy Ghost, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost this, and the slain in the Spirit by the Holy Ghost, you're talking to somebody who don't nothing about the Holy Ghost at all. The Holy Ghost doesn't talk about the Holy Ghost. 1526. Somebody, somebody in the back, would you read that for me real loud? One of you street preachers, give me, give me John 1526 back there, where they all can hear it. He shall testify of who? Who? Who's saying that? Jesus Christ. That's it. He doesn't testify of himself. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, that ain't the Holy Ghost. You ever read your Bible? First Corinthians? Paul, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle by the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings from all the saints in the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we hope that the Lord Jesus Christ, 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 the Lord, that's his job is to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. All this other kind of stuff, this is just a, it's a bunch of stuff. Uh, the Holy Spirit magnifies Jesus Christ and calls your attention to him. Uh, you have a perfect example of that in the Old Testament, which you think a fellow could get if you read it a couple of times. On the Old Testament, there's a case there where Abraham looking for a bride for his son. And you know what Abraham's a type of. You know your Bible. Abraham's a type of uh, God the Father. And Isaac is a type of God the Son. You know that from reading your Bible, if you read your Bible at all. And so he says, I, I want a bride for my son. And who's his son? His son's going to be a type of Christ. He says, I want a bride for my son. And he says, okay, go up there in that foreign country up there or where I came from and get me a bride for my son. And the Eleazar is the type of the Holy Spirit in that passage. And the Eleazar goes up there to Laban's place up there in Mesopotamia. And when he gets up there, he meets Rebecca, the virgin at the well. And she says, we've got provender room for the asses and the camels and stuff. Come on home with me and we'll give you a dinner. And I'm glad to see you because you're kin to us. So he goes home with them, sits down at the table. And he sits down at the table and he tells them about what he'd, what he'd done. And they say, we'll get you something to eat. And he says, I, I can't eat first till I tell you about my master. That's the picture of the Holy Spirit. And he said, my master did this, my master did this. My master said, put your right hand on my thigh and swear to me you won't get a, a bride for my son out of the women of the land and go to the country I came from and get me a bride from there. And he says, uh, so I went and I, got, I came up there by the well and I prayed and I said, Lord God, if you're going to bless me, uh, may if a woman comes to me and says, I'll give you water and your camels too, let that be the one you've chosen. And along came your girl, and she said, I asked her for a drink. She said, I'll get you some and your camels. And he said, I want to tell you about my master. God given him many herds and made him rich, and he had a son. He wanted a bride. All he wants to do is talk about that son. That was his job. He wasn't job wasn't talking about himself. Why, I read my Bible in Genesis 24 when Eliezer got back from that trip that he came back when he got to Abraham. Then he told Abraham of all he'd done. Picture the Holy Spirit. But that's after he brings the bride back. He don't tell anybody what he's done, going and coming. He's there to witness for his Lord. The Bible says the Holy Spirit's in your body, and where the Lord is, that Spirit is the Lord, he says in Second Corinthians. And his job is to testify of Jesus Christ. Uh, I've often wondered about this thing, and perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm wrong about it. Maybe it uh, isn't going to come out right. I don't know about some of these things I talk about. When I don't know what I'm talking about, I'll tell you I don't know. But sometimes it seems to me like from that passage there, that similitude that's found there in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 24, that when we get back, finally get up there in glory of the marriage of the Lamb, after that thing's all over, you know what's going to, what, what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to show everything He did in the church age, if you want to see it. He'll tell about what He did, 
how he got the bride out. Well, the bride is composed of well over, <laughs> well, well over 800 million people, and he'll show you how he got them out. Now, that'll be something to see. That's the television entertainment and glory. <laughs> Imagine sit there flipping on the channel and find out how so and so got saved and how so and so got saved. Won't that be something to see? Now that'll be, you talk about a show, that will be a show. I wish, and we're too late now to do it, but I wish that we'd started taping years ago of the testimonies of our students when they come to class here. Hey, if I wish I had a book with those testimonies in it. That'd be 37 years with the average, maybe coming in another preacher voice class, maybe 25 on average. 25 every year for 37 years. And I've heard them all. So I've sat and right in class with them and heard every one of them. And that is something to hear. Oh, kid, you not, man. That is something to hear. And I mean, you hear some goofball there with it, you know, and some <laughs> twinkies and some crack pots. We get, we get some screwballs once in a while. But it's still interesting. <laughs> I wish we had tapes of those things. But someday, listen, I'll get to heaven. Someday I'll know all about it. All the details. Wouldn't that be something? Now, wouldn't it be something you got up there and found your mother and dad up there in heaven and they never professed Christ and you thought they were lost? And when they were in a coma and in the hospital under all these drugs and stuff, the Holy Spirit was honoring your witness to them and talking to them and they're lying in that bed accepting Christ. Now, wouldn't that be something to see? Now, that'd be something to see. All right, he does that. He magnifies Jesus Christ. Now, that isn't all. He does something else. He produces what we call, or tries to produce what we call, Christ-likeness. That is, the Lord wants you to be like him. And it's his job to mold you and shape you. I talked about it this morning, about increasing and decreasing. And talked about this morning in that passage, and this is in Ephesians 4.13. If you have a Bible there, turn to Ephesians 4.13. And there you'll find this thing about Christ-likeness given. And that passage there, when he's talking about those things, he's talking about till we all come in the unity of the faith to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now it's obvious that that isn't going to happen here. But it's obvious that no matter how much you try to be Christ-like, and I hope you do, uh, you're not going to attain perfection. I'm not going to attain perfection here. There's going to come a time out there in eternity when you're going to be just like Jesus Christ. The fullest, the measure of the stature of, stature of Christ, you're going to be exactly like him. That's clear. He says, God who shall change our vile body and fashion it like according to his glorious body by that working whereby he was able to do all things to himself. And again, he says, he says, uh, uh, whom he called, he uh, predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. God's, pur- God's purpose in saving you, among other things, wasn't just keeping you out of hell. God's purpose in saving you was to make you just like his son, Jesus Christ. So he'd have millions of sons. Billions of sons. He figured on profit. <laughs> I'm not accusing the Lord of being selfish. <laughs> but if he faced with, with, with the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy. What's joyful about getting nailed inside of a barn a bunch of folks making fun of you when you're naked? You call that joy? Who for the joy is set before him? Well, <laughs> he's far-sighted. And Christ's looking beyond the cross. He's looking at a time when he's going to see 150, 900 million replicas of himself. Perfect and stand in front of him, all praising him and yelling yeah. and shouting and giving yeah. him the glory. That's the reward. That's the reward. A prophet, <laughs> good investment, <laughs> made an investment in sinners. There's going to come a time you're all going to wind up just like Jesus Christ. The haste in the day, haste in the day, haste in the day. I'm hearing these fellows this morning praying, you know, and praying this thing we're singing, crown him, crown him, crown him. Uh, I can't wait. Of course, I'll have to wait. And you will too, but I don't like to wait. <laughs> well, I'm for it tonight. So I'm for getting out of here tonight. What I want to see, and you don't understand this unless you've been preaching long as I've been preaching. I've been preaching over half a century. It was 57 years this year, and all this stuff I've been giving out all over the place, I've never even seen the one I'm talking about. You ever think how weird that'd be to spend 57 years bragging on somebody, and you can't even introduce them to anybody? Well, you'd look like a nut, wouldn't you? I mean, so-and-so is my best friend. 
you know. And I've lived with him for 57 years. And where is he? <laughs> well, I just can't tell how wonderful he is. Well, what, I, what do you know about it? You've never seen him. <laughs> see that stuff? I want him to show up. Yeah. See? I want to see him, and then I'm going to say, I told you, I told you, I told you. <laughs> see that? Uh-huh, uh-huh. There he is, right there. Look, right there, see? <laughs> It's not a strange double motive in wanting to get to heaven, you know, to rub it in. <laughs> you know what I want to see? I want to say that I want to see the day that my Savior gets what He has coming to Him. And as far as I'm concerned, at Calvary, He didn't get what He had coming to Him. He got a raw deal. I want to see Him raised King of Kings, Lord of Lords. I want to see all the Muslims and all the Catholics and all the Protestants and all the Jews. And all the Hindus and all the Buddhists flat on their face, boy, singing all hail the power of Jesus' name, letting those prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. Boy, you better have to make me a vicar of Christ. I'll fix your wagon quick, boy. You make me a vicar of Christ, I come to the UN. <laughs> I'll step in there and say, everybody stand. All right, sing with me. I have a guy show them the cards there. They can read out it if they can't sing it. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal dam and crown him. Lord of all. I got assassinated before I got out of the building. Amen. Christ likeness. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. Pure as thou art. I like that song. I like that song because I'm so foreign to it. I like that song because it's so much like what I'm not, but it's so much what I'd like to be. That's what it is. You know, a fellow came up where I came up, and some of you came up the same way. Uh, you've, you've had so much impurity that you appreciate pure things. You know why I really get upset with these fellows that mess with that Bible? You know what the real trouble is? The real trouble is I came up through the sewer, and I know something pure when I see it. And if you're too stupid, I'll help you out. Because I know it when it's pure and when it ain't. And I pick up a book where the, thy word is pure, therefore thy servant loveth. Every word of God is pure. Tried in the furnace of fire seven times. I know it's pure from experience. And that's what I want. I want something like that. That's what I want. Now bless God, someday I'll have, I'll be completely pure. And just like Him. And if you're saved, that's going to be your condition too. Hard to believe, ain't it? Go on, go on right, look in the mirror. And sit out there, you are just like Jesus Christ. <laughs> You'll get laughing. <laughs> it's pitiful, man. It's pitiful. <laughs> but that's the way she's going. And every day of your life, if you're growing in grace, God is working you closer and closer and closer and closer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't hear charismatic talk about that either. They don't give very much credit. They think he just makes people blabber in tongues and flops them down in the spirit and gives them a good feeling once in a while. You sure under you sure short sheeted him. He got plenty to do. <laughs> oh, it's Christ likeness, Christ likeness. Like an old color fellow said, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only somebody what nobody can match. <laughs> That's it. The only somebody nobody can match. Nobody can be just exactly like he is. Uh, you take John O'Reilly's little fellow to Christ in jail one time, and he was out there in the bullpen. I've had this happen too, and I borrowed this stuff from Rice when I heard about his experience. And he led a fellow to Christ in the bullpen of a prison one time, and he told the fellow, Now, if you get saved, he said, You're going to have a hard time of it. And if you don't mean business, you better hadn't accept Christ because of your buddies in here. And he says, They're going to be the first people I'm going to tell about him. And John O'Reilly said, Okay, go to it, young fellow. You got it. I led a couple of guys to Christ one time up in Baymanette, Alabama, in the county jail up there. And uh, they were all about 19 and 20, and second-degree murder they were involved in. And they were there in the bullpen, I guess, waiting for trial. Or, you know, they made the head trial and were waiting there to get transferred on the next uh, jail. And uh, uh, two, of them, two of them, the two kids got saved in the, in the bullpen. There was about 10 guys there, you know playing checkers and playing cards and looking at playboy and stuff. I had them right up against the bars and had prayer with them. Both of them got saved. And I said, now, fellas, uh, you're going to have a rough time in here. I know the crew you're with. It's going to be rough. You're going to stand up for Christ. You're going to get persecuted. And one of those kids turned around and faced that bunch, and they got real quiet while we were praying. 
They kind of held up a minute and looked up. And that one young kid turned around and right in front of me and the rest of them, he said, I don't owe these fellows here in anything. They got me in trouble and like they got me killed. I don't owe them anything. I'm going to live for Christ. I said, boy, you got it, man. <laughs> Sick of <him>, tiger. <laughs> now, you got that. You got the real thing. All right. Now, the Holy Spirit prays. He not only prays, he helps us pray. His work is there. Take Romans 8.26. Get a hold of Romans 8.26. You see it there. Romans 8.26. The Holy Spirit not only helps you pray, but he prays. You're told there in uh, Romans chapter 8.26, uh, he makes intercession for us with groaning and cannot be uttered. Here are a bunch of folks talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, and the groanings in their prayer. The Bible says these groanings can't be uttered. If you can hear them, that ain't the groanings. <laughs> these groanings can't be uttered. And the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's the Holy Spirit praying for you. How many times have you said, and I've certainly said, I've said it enough times, many times, I said, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? When I go out and meet and people say, oh, Brother Ruckman, I'm praying for you. I say, boy, keep me on the list. Keep me on the list. <laughs> And they say, anything special? I say, yeah. I say, yeah, pray for my eyes. I need prayer for my eyes. And they promise to pray, and I know a lot of them do pray. And I thank God they are praying. But I got a better prayer warrior than that. John 17, Christ says, Christ says, I pray for them whom you've given me. You got a real intercessor. That the Lord himself. He would search the hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit. The, the Lord and the Spirit are one. The Lord's in you. The Spirit's in you. And he makes intercession for the saints. You have somebody praying for you that never had a prayer that went unanswered. He says, he says, oh, Father, he says, I know thou always hear me, he says. So the Holy Spirit helps you in prayer. That's just part of his job. It's part of his job is intercession. The great intercessory prayer in the Bible is not our Father which art in heaven. That's a disciple's prayer. The Catholics always call that the Lord's Prayer. They are Father. That's a desperate lie. Jesus Christ never prayed our Father a day in his life. Now, if you don't believe me, why don't you look it up? Christ wouldn't think of praying our Father. The disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, quote, when you pray, you say our Father. He never said our Father a day in his life. When Christ prays, you know what he says? He says, Father. He says, he says Holy Father. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Father, I will you, those who have given me, be where I am. Father, he never says, our Father. But he said, our Father, he put, him, put himself in the same shoes with you. And he wasn't a sinner. You got no, no problem with that kind of business. That's, that's, that's supposed to be a, that's a, that's a disciple's prayer. That our Father. That's not a, that's not a prayer for Christ. Christ says, Holy Father, and steps right in. So you know what the Pope does? He pretends he's the Holy Father. I mean, what a dirty blasphemer. <laughs> oh, there in John chapter 17, Holy Father, he says, and then the newspapers call that old mutton head over there, Holy Father. Why, can't even keep yourself alive, man, let alone pull himself out of the grave after he'd been bid dead three days. I mean, the very idea, Holy Father, Holy Father. And the newspapers say, The Holy Father. You mean there isn't another one? What are you newspaper reporters, a bunch of atheists? Why, you discriminatory bigots. The real idea of calling the Pope the Holy Father after Christ just showed you it was his Father. I mean, what a shot, man, what a shot. I know it doesn't upset you people, most of you. Most of you people, the words don't mean a whole lot to you, don't a whole lot of reading. I know, I just get in trouble from doing so much reading, see. If I could just quit reading, we could talk like a gentleman, ladies, and just long fine. As long as I read, I get madder and madder and madder. <laughs> and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall enrage you, man. Uh, you say, well, I don't like the way they treat my God and Savior. Now, I wouldn't kill them like Muhammad would. I wouldn't arrest them like the Catholics would. I wouldn't persecute them. I wouldn't run them out of the old folks' home like the Camelite tried to run this brother out. I wouldn't take vengeance on them, but I don't like them. And I'd tell them quick. You take this kind of business here. When, when, I, when, when, when you pray, you have two... two the Holy Spirit in you, setting that message up there, and the Lord at the right hand of the throne, wherefore he is able to say to the uttermost, them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 
That's me. That's you if you're saved. What does it help you pray? We know not what we should pray for if we should. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. If uh, And if you are honest with yourself, I'm sure you've run into places where, honestly, God, you didn't know exactly what to pray or how to pray about it. And sometimes we think we need something we don't need. And sometimes we think we uh, need uh, don't need something we do need. I, I, I can't be sure I'm always praying right. I can search the Scripture. I can search the Scripture. I can search the Scripture and pray according to the will of God. as near like I can find the will of God in the Scripture. But while I'm praying, uh, you know, for good health, maybe I need a whipping. <laughs> when I'm praying for soul to be saved, maybe I need to pray to be humble. Maybe I'm not praying right. I don't know. I uh, get praying for people. I pray for people. But I don't always know what to pray. It's been my experience in prayer. There's always something they know about the person I don't know. It's a strange thing. There's always something there. And I can't, I don't have complete information. But I know somebody does. The Holy Spirit helps the fellow pray. Oh, uh, pray for me, the folks say. That's what to do. Now the habit, the habit of prayer is good, but the spirit of prayer is better. The habit of prayer, that's good. But the spirit of prayer is better. Now what do you mean by that? I mean by that, I mean that, uh, it's better to pray by my instinct and by duty.